Tonight's lecture, Mapping Justice, is both an extension of and I think also a critique of the role that visualizing data or information has played in the, in the architecture profession, certainly at least from, from the, our disciplinary perspective. One of its significances is as an intervention in this, this phenomenon that has gained momentum over the past decade or so of architects ex extending their modes of practice to include the analysis and presentation of information, often through graphic means. Um, it's meant a new interaction with cartography and, and geography, um, new attention to, to sociology and, um, and other related social science disciplines. In, in this kind of practice, architects have engaged earlier than is the norm with the formulation of the project. They often are involved uh, or, or use their ability to, to create graphic representations of information as a way of repositioning their role within the, the commit process of formulating, commissioning, and executing design projects. Um, and, and this kind of work is a, a way of constructing a site representationally and creating a context for action and for design. Sometimes this kind of research is geared primarily toward creating, uh, geared primarily toward capturing new markets for architectural services. Not entirely a bad thing, um, but it often also becomes a way for architects to uh, engage their work in fundamental ways with, with questions, with social questions, with questions of equity, justice, um, and possibilities for social transformation. And the work we're going to see tonight um, very clearly comes out of that desire to put architectural skills and cartographic thinking, geographic thinking, uh, at, at the center of practices that are geared toward, toward social transformation or social reform. So tonight we'll look at some work that combines incisive policy analysis with clear and compelling visualization strategies to open up possibilities for changing the ways we understand, and, uh, understand crime, punishment, and rehabilitation, and hopefully the ways we practice uh, not only uh, criminal justice, but also architecture, urban design, um, and, and other practices. So tonight's uh, lecture, Mapping Justice, is, is part of a, of a larger set of, of events. Um, one of them is a, an exhibition that is linked to the, to the lecture um, and is opening tonight at Think Gallery, three blocks east of here on Fayette Street at South Clinton. Um, and in fact, we're going to have an opening reception for the show immediately following the lecture, so at around 6 o'clock. Um, and I will I, I, I invite and ask each of you to join us in that, um, not only for the, the hors d'oeuvres and, and wine, but also because it'll give you a chance to inspect in greater detail um, in the gallery installation the work that you'll be uh, seeing in the, in the lectures, or some of which you'll be seeing in the lecture. Um, and so if you'll join the parade, we'll have the, the opening afterward, the reception, um, a couple blocks east of here again at Think Gallery. Um, it, there's also a roundtable discussion, uh, which I think is listed here. No, not in this version. Um, a roundtable discussion on November 9 at Think Gallery, which will take up more of these, um, more of these questions and, and frame them in different ways in, in relation to uh, in part to Syracuse specific uh, contexts. Uh, more broadly, this, uh, this material, both the, uh, <laughs> I'll ignore that, uh, both the exhibition, the lecture, and, and the roundtable are part of Syracuse Symposium, a, a semester long series of events that many of you have probably know, know, probably know about and may have attended already. Um, of, organized by the College of Arts and Sciences on behalf of the university, this year with the theme of, of justice, asking questions about um, fairness and equity in, in our society through many different strategies, through um, lectures, performances, exhibitions, other special events that explore the meaning of justice both as an ideal and as a reality um, imperfectly realized in, in our everyday lives. And so Chief Justice John Roberts has spoken in this series. Medical anthropologist Paul Farmer was here. Um, and sustainable food advocates Judy Wicks and Alice Waters um, have been part of this series, as, as well as many others. 
Um, and this is, this is uh, an event that was sponsored in part by uh, Syracuse Symposium and the College of Arts and Sciences, partly by the School of Architecture, and partly by the Department of Geography in the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Um, and it came together through that, that, those joint efforts and also, of course, the generosity of Think Gallery in allowing us to work with them in, in staging the exhibition. And so thanks are due uh, to our speakers, whom I'll introduce in this most long-winded of, of introductions, but uh, whom I will introduce. Um, also to Candace Salamone from the College of Arts and Sciences and Syracuse Symposium, to Don Mitchell, department chair in the Department of Geography, um, and within the School of Architecture, not only to John Yoder, who organizes the lecture series, but also to John Bonn and Zach Seibold, who designed and, and built the exhibition installation that you'll be uh, toasting, I think, um, a little bit later this evening. So uh, thanks to all those people who helped make this possible. So I'll try to now get things going. Um, our two speakers, Eric Kadora and Laura Kurgan. Um, Eric is director of the Justice Mapping Center, which uses computer mapping and other graphical depictions of quantitative data to analyze and communicate social policy information. He previously worked at the After Prison Initiative, uh, and at the Center for Alternative Sentencing and Employment Services. And so he comes out of the world of criminal justice and especially the world of nonprofits and analyzing and, uh, and modeling alternative possibilities in the world of criminal justice. And he's the co-author with Dr. Todd Clear of the book Community Justice, which came out in 2003 and which reviews the emergence of community policing in the 1980s community courts in the 1990s, and emerging community corrections practices in this decade. Laura Kurgan is an architect and principal of Laura Kurgan Design, an interdisciplinary design practice that blends academic research with work that includes uh, design, communication, and advocacy, mostly focusing on spaces where questions of politics and ethics demand innovative design strategies. These have included school reform, criminal justice reform, human rights, conflict mapping, and memorials. She has ongoing research projects focusing on the declassification of satellite imagery and GPS technology, and she has worked with new visions for public schools on the reprogramming and master planning of 21 large public school buildings into campuses of smaller schools. Um, she also teaches architecture at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation, where she's Director of Visual Studies and Director of the Spatial Information Design Lab. This last is a recently formed Think Plus Action Tank set up to foster collaborations like this one between architecture and other disciplines. Um, and some of this work will be exhibited um, in the Museum of Modern Art this winter in the exhibition Design and the Elastic Mind. So with that, I turn things over to first, I think, Eric Cadora and then Laura Kurgan. Can you all hear me? Yes. <laughs> well, um, I'll get started anyways. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, as uh, Jonathan made clear, um, I'm confession make. I'm neither an architect uh, nor a geographer. Um, but have stolen freely from design and uh, geographic information systems over the last 10 years uh, to try to do something that we in the sort of criminal justice policy reform world, as small and ar ar archaic as that might be, um, have been trying to do around rethinking and recasting the criminal justice conversation that's been traditionally um, conducted in this country for the last 20 years. Uh, it's, it's kind of important just to give you, I'm going to give you just sort of a quick um, criminal justice policy um, intro and, and the way we use geography, mapping, and so on, um, and design to help recast that conversation, um, and then sort of turn it over to Laura, with whom we started to collaborate about three and a half years ago to take this work um, uh, deeper and think about new audiences 
and new ways of, of understanding this information. Um, but let me give you just sort of a quick background on how all this started. Um, this all started in, in great part because of what's happened in the United States over the last 30 years, what some of us call the experiment in mass incarceration. Uh, and for those of you who sort of don't know this story, I'll tell you very quickly, uh, our incarceration rate in this country had been about the same, maintained about the same levels for about 100 years, uh, until around the 1970s, early 80s, when it skyrocketed uh, more than tenfold. So that back in the 1970s, we used to incarcerate uh, around 200,000 people at any one time in the country, while today we incarcerate over 2 million at any one time. We're now the um, highest, we now have the highest rate of incarceration of any country in the world, whether it's South Africa, Russia, China, um, we now have that dubious distinction. Uh, so it is in that sort of background um, that we've been doing our work. And the area that, that we've started in, and sort of the conversation um, that we were, in, in essence, trying to interrupt, was a conversation that was very um, much a polemic. Uh, you're either soft on crime or you need to get tough. And those of us who were trying to rethink and help um, uh, come up with alternative ways to deal with all the issues around crime and punishment uh, found ourselves trapped. So about uh, seven, eight years ago, um, I was lucky enough to be working at the Center for Alternative Sentencing in New York, which was the largest alternative to incarceration uh, agency in the country. And I was given six months to do what we called back then, um, and we stole from, I think it was Xerox, uh, Skunk Works, which was a period of research without uh, a specified goal. And the question for me was, how can we change this conversation from the kind of sentencing reform questions we had been dealing with to, to, to escape the easy pigeonholing that we had been um, trapped in? Uh, and that's when I started to come across mapping as a way to rethink crime and justice and the way we talk about it uh, in this country. Um, traditionally, uh, we use data uh, in criminal justice to talk about sentencing. We think about justice as an individual by individual, case by case, kind of objective decision making. And it was that kind of um, thinking that we wanted to interrupt. So before I sort of get to where, where we, what the pictures we first started to generate, um, I'm going to give you a quick run through of um, how our maps communicate this information. And I'm sure many of you are already familiar with GIS and how it works. Um, but maybe for my own benefit or those few of you who don't, let me give you a quick look. So this, I always start with this first map, which this set of maps, which represents data we got uh, in 2003 for everyone who was admitted to prison from New York City over the course of that year, 2003, and where they lived before they went in. Uh, now, the first map on the left here represents each one of those individuals with a dot, right? So the bright red represents an individual person who went to prison um, and you can see sort of every, you can't see every dot, but you can start to see how that, uh, but that's a hard map to read, doesn't really tell you what's going on. So usually what GIS allows us to do is aggregate. That is, take uh, larger areas and count the dots in those areas. So if you look at the second uh, map here, what we've done is taken the, same, the city, New York City, and divided it up into census tracts, U.S. census tracts, small areas defined by the U.S. census, counted up all the individuals in each census tract who were sent to prison from that tract, and then color-coded it according to the numbers of people, with the brightest red representing the highest numbers. Now, you can just keep going and going and going and do that in any number of ways. So here, we've, in the third map, we've aggregated even larger to what in New York City are these sort of political and planning districts, community districts, and again, added them all up, and you see the highest concentrations in these areas uh, in, in Manhattan and Brooklyn and so on. Now, for us, this, was, this is a really powerful way to convey information. It seems simple and straightforward, but it has some interesting ins and outs. These are three maps um, uh, that use exactly the same data, but use different borders to communicate that data. So you can see very quickly how the communication and the message changes. 
So in, oops, so in the first map, um, as we already saw, the community districts, you can see where the highest concentrations are. Now, again, dividing all the data up into four in the same way, same city, but using different boundaries. Instead of community districts here, we're using school districts. And counting up those same cases, this looks like a very different map of prison concentration. Then finally, thirdly, looking at state senate districts, counting up the same cases and highlighting the highest levels. Again, a very different map. Now, that's one way some people talk about lying with statistics or leading. That's, that's, it's, it's actually, that's, that's, um, it, is a, it is a very uh, a manipulated way to, to, to look at this data because, in fact, for example, you can see this uh, state senate district here is coded as the highest level. But in fact, most of the admissions to prison come from this area right here. So that if you broke it down, as we have in smaller maps, this is not so high a concentration area. But nevertheless, it's about the audience you're talking to. And for those of us who are trying to communicate, when we're trying to connect issues of prison and issues of schooling, it makes sense to use school districts. For those of us who are trying to change legislation in the state senate, we use senate districts. And it starts to get uh, very audience-oriented. The boundaries become very connected to who you're talking to. So let me go back now to sort of talk about uh, some of the work that we've done uh, and started doing around the country. This is that same map of New York City, uh, and it allowed us, uh, and what we first did was we said, historically, the kind of uh, way criminal justice had used maps was in crime mapping. And I'm sure you've heard of hotspot mapping and, and that sort of thing. And that led, that is where do crimes happen? Let's, let's count them up, let's show where the concentrations and hotspots are, and let's attack those areas and deal with crime in those areas. Very tactical, law enforcement oriented way of thinking. What struck us was, what if we started to map where people lived rather than where crimes happen? Because that's going to tell a completely different story. Uh, it's not to say that one is wrong and one is right, of course not, but it rather recontextualizes the conversation in a completely other domain. So instead of leading with uh, where crimes happen and leading to uh, tech, tactical law enforcement strategies, which continue to go on, we started to say, what if, if we mapped where people lived, that would place it in a context for more strategic thinking in the long term about conditions. So it has enabled us, um, and I'll show you sort of the details of this map, to start talking about crime and justice in terms of places, rather than in terms of being, being tough or getting soft. Um, so here's a map that, that uh, maps the rate of incarceration uh, per thousand uh, adults uh, in New York City over the course of one year. And it's broken up into census tracts. That's the uh, smallest little areas you'll see here. And then the larger boundaries are those community districts we looked at before. And the reason, of course, we use rates rather than simply just numbers is because if we just count and use numbers, we may in fact be mapping uh, population density rather than rates of incarceration, right? So we'll be showing where the most people live because that's likely to be where most people come from who go to prison. So instead, we want to do it per thousand people, normalizes everything, and shows you where the highest intensity is. And it's very clear how, how radically different it is in particular neighborhoods than in others. So you'll see the highest rates of incarceration in the city we found in, in the South Bronx, in Harlem, and in Bed-Stuy Bed in East New York, in Brooklyn. And we wanted to think of another way of expressing this spatial distribution. Because in fact, what we thought of and what we normally think of as individual by individual decisions about crime, who goes to prison, and what for, turns out when you map it this way, when you look at the data in a different way in terms of people over time in a place, does not look like a bunch of random individual decisions, but in fact looks more like a, a grand social policy uh, that targets particular areas, even if it's unintentional. The other way we did this was we sort of looked at the highest uh, 14 or so um, districts and added up the percentages of the population and the percentages of people who go to prison to really get a sense of how disproportionate it is. So what we found was in these 12, 14 areas, uh, they accounted for about 17% of the city's adult population, but accounted for more than half of the city's adults sent to prison, right? Highly disproportionate number. 
But this simple turn, what seems like a pretty straightforward thing, had never been done and was a, a radical change in how people talked about crime and justice and allowed us to start talking about and allowed policymakers to start talking about um, Bedford Stuyvesant and what's going on in Bed Stuy or what's going on in the South Bronx rather than uh, simply about are we being tough enough or, or soft or too soft. The overall picture, while that map is static, it really represents a flow of people from those communities to state prisons and back to those communities over the course of a number of years. So one of the things we did is we looked at how long people go away to prison, et cetera. And what you find and what we know is that 95% of people go to prison come back eventually. And in fact, more than half in New York State were returning within four years. So really what we have isn't just a bunch of individual decisions about justice, but rather a large scale uh, population displacement and resettlement policy, even, again, if it were unintentional, that is looking at it from a de demographic, uh, geographic perspective, putting aside questions of how one feels about sentencing laws and so on, you get a completely different picture of what's going on. Then we said, okay, let's take this another step forward in, in recasting this conversation and ask something about accountability. Uh, and this is where we came up with the ideas of the million dollar blocks. That is, we said, look, we know where everyone went to prison, we know how long they went to prison for, and we know how much it cost to keep them in prison while they were gone. And we know it for every place that they lived. So we turned the, population, the prison population map into a money map that said, block by block, how much we were spending each year to remove and return people to and from prison each year from each of those sites. And we found, in the case of New York City, uh, over 35 individual blocks where we were spending more than a million dollars a year, not where, but for which we were spending more than a million dollars a year to remove and return people, where none of that investment, of course, was going into changing the conditions in those places, but rather to rent cells. So by doing this and estimating those amounts, we started to try to create a, uh, a way to reclaim accountability for that investment. We started to talk about it in these very business-like terms. What's the return on investment for these places for the multiple millions of dollars we spend each year to remove and return people? Are we gaining something for that investment? What are we gaining? Is there a public safety gain? Is there a social gain? Oh, what's happening? Uh, and that spurred a whole different kind of conversation and has led to a number of national policy projects around these ideas that we've called justice reinvestment, which has been linked to controlling and reducing prison populations, taking savings from that, and reinvesting in neighborhoods that have the highest incarceration and reentry rates. So that, you know, we totaled many of these up for each of these community districts. We found Bed-Stuy at around $60 million a year we were spending. Uh, East New York over here around $50 million, $40 million around for um, uh, East Harlem and so on. So that borough by borough, the Bronx, we were spending over $335 million a year. Uh, Brooklyn, $400 million a year. Essentially, $1.5 billion a year was being spent to remove and return people. Now, there, we all know there are people who need to be removed and, re and, and removed from, from society and kept safe, but what I was trying to point out early on was we have changed that profile radically. What used to be 200,000 people is now 2 million people, essentially due to uh, the criminalization mainly of, of drug cases. That has been perhaps the highest contributor um, to the prison population. The other thing to know here, and we've done maps, of course, that simply show the socio-demographics, these are all minority neighborhoods. So this is not only, this is a race and a class issue and a criminal justice issue all sort of rolled into one. Uh, now we did some work for the mayor's office on, on poverty and they had been looking at criminal justice and disconnected youth. And so we started adding to, these, to this background map of incarceration, layering on top of it other um, kinds of critical factors. And in this case, we started to identify disconnected youth as, as, as was defined by their being not in school, having no high school diploma and not working. 
And so we started to identify all the districts where there were at least 10% of all the 16 to 19 year olds were either not working, not in school, or had no, no high school diploma. And you'll see how, of course, quickly they overlap, except with one uh, exception, with the highest incarceration neighborhoods. Um, and again, it's starting to, to connect issues that we haven't been necessarily connecting in the past. <clears throat> now, we've been doing this work with a couple of national organizations around the country um, in states that, as I noted earlier in terms of this justice reinvestment concept, are interested and willing and want to think about curtailing their ever-increasing prison population. Something that's not easily known today is that despite the lauded historic drops in crime over the last 15 years, we've had no drop in the prison population. In fact, it continues to rise. And the more you understand about these connections, the more you realize that prison populations have only partially, partial relation to crime rates. Prison populations are related in great part to prison policies, uh, partially due to crime rates, but in great part partially to do what we decide to criminalize, how long we criminalize it for, how we enforce it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, states are the places that feel this the most because states have to foot the bill. Uh, the, the logic we brought to all of this was that um, locally, if you wanted to say, well, we're going to take a whole class of people who are involved in lower level crimes, and instead of paying to send them to prison, we want to keep them here and work with them on a, in another capacity, it's the local city that has to foot the bill. While if we send them to prison, it's the state that foots the bill. So what we identified was this sort of financial disincentive to local innovation and local solutions. It's cheaper, easier, and we don't have to deal with it if we simply send people. But people were starting to learn that everyone comes back and we have to deal with our communities. And so that has spurred a rethinking around the country. Another way we try to reconnect all of this um, criminal justice uh, concentration with other resources has been by looking at other populations that are, uh, that are overseen by major government programs. So this is a, a map of Phoenix, two maps of Phoenix, um, Arizona. And what we've done on the left is uh, mapped juveniles who were sent to detention over the course of a year uh, from all the places they lived in Phoenix. And in this case, we did a slightly different way of mapping. Um, we laid a grid over the city and measured everyone in each cell and asked how many people and so on. So here what we found was we measured foster care placements against, uh, jail, uh, against juvenile detentions, and you can see almost mirror images. Similarly, we took the adult prison population, compared it to people receiving temporary assistance for needy families, the old welfare system. Again, using location as a way to reconnect agencies that have no connection to one another, but yet we're working in this, for the same neighborhoods and with the same populations. And again, using the maps was a way of doing this that uh, connected researchers with government agency spokespeople and lay people because everyone gets it. Everyone gets the maps. You do it in tables, it's, people get lost. But you show the maps, they'll get the idea very quickly. And I'll just run through a very quick couple of other examples of this same kind of thing. We recently did work in Houston, Texas, um, where we saw some of the most egregious differences between high incarceration neighborhoods and low incarceration neighborhoods. We found about 5% of the population in these seven high incarceration neighborhoods um, represented over a quarter of the prison population. Um, we then, uh, in, in, in Texas, the state legislature was not only debating prison expansion, but schools and school funding. So we started to connect, through a few different studies, the highest performing schools with the neighborhoods that they were in. And so what you'll see here is a map. The large yellow circles represent high performing high schools. And in the background, you see uh, a high incarceration and low incarceration rate neighborhoods. And you could literally draw a line, a wall, in the way we did, that separates them from one another, the highest being in the lowest incarceration centers, and vice versa, the lowest performing high schools, all being, sought, all being placed in the highest incarceration neighborhoods. And again, tagging each of those neighborhoods with the annual imprisonment costs that we were expending to send people back and forth from prison to home. 
Uh, we did some similar things in thinking about resources differently uh, in Austin, Texas. We mapped um, where probationers are concentrated, and this is a slightly different use of mapping and density mapping. And we found some interesting things, um, which I'm, I'll, I'll kind of skip over. We found that quickly that uh, these are all where probationers were concentrated along the city, but we found that uh, the, those who failed probation, as opposed to those who succeeded, were concentrated in particular areas. Right? And we didn't know why, what, why that happened. We're still trying to figure out, but the mapping has brought this out and is getting probation and parole to rethink what they do. Because traditionally, these agencies are very uh, cloistered in their downtown offices. They're not very related to the neighborhoods where most of their charges come from. So we decided to map that a little bit. We took one officer and we mapped all his cases from his office and where they lived and drew this kind of spider map to represent that. And then we did the same thing in the south office. And you can see that they're all over the city in the highest concentration areas. And then we asked a couple of questions. We said, what's the average caseload of an individual officer? We found that was about 120. But then we said, well, let's take one zip code and ask how many probationers are there. And we found about 680. That accounts for about six caseloads at 120 apiece. But then we said, how many actual officers are those 688 assigned to? Well, it turns out they were assigned to 72 different officers because those officers aren't assigned to those areas and those cases aren't assigned by geography. So we took the data set, we reassigned all the cases to different officers, and we came up with cases that looked more like this. And of course, you can imagine all the ways you can become more oriented to local areas. You could focus officers in just one area and so on. We've done the same kind of thing in Nevada where we're working on a reinvestment project Again, we located all the zip codes. We counted up the number of caseloads in each zip code as a map for the probation office to say, oh, well, we could station four officers in this area and deal with all those cases. They'd get to know what's going on in the neighborhoods. They'd reconnect. They'd gain something. They'd work with local agencies, et cetera. Uh, we then went further and further to try to help show how just coding these larger areas in fact, is also a little bit misleading, and you have to get down into the almost architectural levels of analysis to really see what's going on, and started to link where people lived with the highest imprisonment rates, which turned out to be a transitional housing uh, area, a, a public housing area, and an apartment building with the drug treatment and um, uh, prevention resources in the neighborhood, and help them explore ways why those folks were not making it to those areas, what kinds of outreach and um, internal relationships uh, could be established between those places uh, and those neighborhoods. Uh, finally, I'm just going to wrap up very quickly and say that it's, we've been doing this for about seven, eight years now and have been very careful about getting this out into the public domain, have really focused on lawmakers and so on, but have increasingly wanted to get this story out um, into the public in a way that uh, makes sense. And we've experimented with a few reporters. We now work with lots of different reporters. But just as an example of one that went both badly and well, we worked with a daily news reporter in New York City who, who we gave a lot of information to about where um, people were coming from who were going to prison. And he went off and did a lot of research, interviewed a lot of people. And when we finally opened the story on Sunday, we saw this scare headline that, you know, almost gave me a, a heart attack. Convict Alley in Harlem Nave, right? If you couldn't ask for a worse sort of headline to this story. Oddly enough, though, when you read the story, it turns out that this is the best story that could have been written about this, because what happens is it turns out that anyone who reads the story will think that law enforcement, any more law enforcement could not possibly help this particular neighborhood, that it will require a reinvestment in the infrastructure, housing, education, and so on in that place to make a difference. And he forced a lot of the sort of government officials to react to these figures and these numbers and got them to say, yes, that's why we're starting to rethink how we reinvest our resources. Um, one article in, the, in Time magazine that did, get it, that did get it right in title, which was the best way to reduce recidivism is through rehabilitation, but not of prisoners, but of the neighborhoods that produce them. But then the article went on to say all kinds of cra crazy and scary things. But they got the headline right. So it's a real shot in the dark, and, we, you know, and all the design and mapping work has been around trying to think about ways in which 
we can recast this conversation on crime into a much richer one that has much more to do with social, economic, and uh, uh, other conditions in those neighborhoods that are most affected by this. And in great part, that's why we teamed up with, uh, with the School of Architecture at Columbia and Laura Kurgan, was to help us start thinking about how do you rethink this stuff? How do you recast it? How do you go deeper into it to get the message across and recruit other disciplines into thinking about solutions um, to this problem? All right, so let me turn it over to Laura. Um, can everybody, can everyone hear me? Go ahead, just keep talking. Yeah. Can you get the, can the image go? There you go. Okay. Um, so first of all, I want to thank Jonathan Massey for first his um, great introduction, which I think really um, cost the, all the research in terms of how it does have a, a reference to architecture and very sort of current um, discussions about design and research in architecture, which I think is relevant to most of the students, at least in the audience. Um, and to Don, Don Mitchell and Jonathan for bringing the show of the exhibition here and funding it, etc. And thanks to Eric for <laughs> three years of collaboration. Um, and the project has, has um, really has evolved um, in, many, in many different directions. And so what I'm going to do is, you'll see in some ways, is, is somewhat of a repeat of what, Eric, um, of what Eric presented. But I'm going to do it from a, from a very different point of view. And um, you know, since what Eric um, had already brought to the project was the first creative move, really, and maybe the, maybe the only creative move of the, of the project, which was to take a list of data and focus on the home address. Um, that was the first thing he did with these data sets, which means, of course, that once you privilege the home address, the city is on trial. And I actually, in the end, don't have conclusions about this research, and we, we're still writing some things and trying to make some conclusions, so any help that you all can provide will be extremely uh, useful to the, to the conclusion of the project, right? So, um, so a as I say, we brought these data sets, we brought them to design studio, studio at Columbia, and we also um, managed to bring Eric in as a consultant for two years, you know, into both into the design studio and into the lab. And the project is really, therefore, a, a collaboration between a criminal justice person, an architect, myself, uh, GIS and urban planner, Sarah Williams, and a graphic designer, David Reinford. And so the first thing that we tried to do was to communicate this, this creative move which Eric and his team had made into, into a message and into a set of maps which were, which were leg legible and not just the sort of typical GIS standard. So we broke some rules, um, which was very necessary. Okay, so um, the city, uh, this is how sort of I frame the project <laughs> or as, a, as an architect, right? So um, a city is not simply a collection of people and buildings, but um, a network of relationships. And the, you know, this kind of, where's the, um, the pointer? What? Which one? This, the top one. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. Um, Okay, so you can all read this diagram, it's self-explanatory. Um, but the premise behind the way we approach the work is that starting with a data set, 
um, often informs a set of design decisions, which informs a set of policy, the built in, and there's this kind of feedback loop which happens between these various things. But more importantly, the word infrastructure, as you know, is bandied about a lot in architecture nowadays and, and um, assumes a certain very large scale project. And so the premise begins, or the project begins, with this hidden word over there um, in the definition of the word infrastructure. Um, and the fact that you, because of this definition, you have to understand that prisons are part of infrastructure, but because they're not inside of the city, we forget about them. So the first premise to any, any group is that the prisons and the people they house are part of our urban, our urban communities, and we should not forget them. Um, on the other hand, it's no big surprise that the word prison appears in the definition of the word infrastructure in this country because as Eric um, explained to you, prison populations have increased rapidly from the year 1970 to the year 2000. So here are two graphs. The top one is a crime, is a graph of crime rates, which you can see from 1970 sort of rises and falls according to the ebbs and flows of the economy, while from 1970 the prison population steadily rises. On the other hand, public housing in the United States currently shelters approximately 3 million people in 1.3 million households. Um, that statistic is a little bit too close for comfort. So as we know from driving on the highway, from going to bank machines, from your ID card, and I'm sure in the university, we all are translated into, into data sets. It's common knowledge uh, for us, right? But the data sets that um, Eric and I have been working with are not easily um, accessed data sets. And in fact, once I go further with the project, you'll, you'll sort of understand why. So this is what we do. We just take this list of data um, and taking one tab of that, of that data um, and putting it, Eric explained this very clearly, a series of points. Once you bring census block in, you align it with the census blocks, and when you give it a scale, you get a map of um, something. In this case, prison admissions and its counts, counts uh, per census block. So the data in geographic context shows that people in prison are highly concentrated in neighborhood areas, while crime is more dispersed across the city. So this is a, a map of prison admission by density or hotspots. And this is a map of low, of nonviolent crime. So if you go back and forth, you notice that crime is more dispersed across the city while prison admissions are concentrated. So furthermore, crime geographies, um, we would say, lead to crime prevention tactics, um, while prison geographies, we would like to say, lead to justice reinvestment strategies. OK. So um, yeah. Prison geographies um, intersect on the whole with neighborhoods of color, although it's not, it's not very, over here you see Brooklyn, which is a majority minority city, so it's not all the neighborhoods um, that are relevant, but still. And this is a map of the percentage of, of people living in poverty in, in Brooklyn. And this is a map of the percentage of adults admitted to prison. So you see um, these overlaps, which you'll become very familiar with by the end of my talk. So added up block by block, it costs $395 million to imprison people from Brooklyn each year. When you quantify it um, this way, you know, using the expenditures per census block. So from a demographic point of view, the spending facilitates what you heard earlier, mass migration of people to prison. More importantly, 95% of whom eventually return home. So this is a map which shows a connection between the home address of an incarcerated person to where they are located in prison. Very relevant to us over here, upstate New York. Um, when you zoom in, and this was my first impulse um, to want to do with Eric's project was to zoom in. So community district 16 in Brooklyn has 3.5% of Brooklyn's population but 8.5% of its prison admissions, and that's what we look for, are these concentrations. So when you zoom in, um, these are the people admitted to prison. This is how much it costs to incarcerate each one of them. 
And these are the buildings that they live in. So I don't know if we have a lot of undergraduates in this audience, but that kind of uh, <laughs> building footprint is um, recognizable, right? So from those 11 uh, blocks, it cost $11 million to incarcerate people from these 11 blocks in 2003, and that's what we call million, million dollar blocks. On a financial scale, um, prison is becoming the predominant governing institution in this neighborhood. And the prisoners come home, up to 50% of those who come home are eventually returned to prison. Nationally, 650,000 people return home from prison every year. So, um, this is where we go from here. Okay, I'm going to make a, a shift. So this is the show that was um, up at the Architectural League. It was actually um, a competition that we won. It was a call from the Architecture League for a, um, architecture and dot, 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 and we proposed architecture and justice and was supposed to um, expand architecture beyond its conventional definitions of, of, what it, of what it is, how it functions in contemporary cities. So we um, produced these pamphlets which were distributed. Um, there's a PowerPoint which is, and this, th these are the, this is the show that's actually in the gallery right now. Um, but most importantly, actually, I think the reason that we won this competition is that we hosted um, a scenario planning workshop um, at, in the space halfway through the exhibition and then, and then exhibited the results of the, of the workshop in the space of the gallery. So um, what you see over here is the result, really the true result of the collaboration between Eric and myself, which is um, scenario planning is a, is a method of um, imagining the future, which was devised by a group called the Global Business Network in um, San Francisco. And they were associated with Wired magazine when we started. Some, you know, in some ways, it's kind of old fashioned. But it does it, the job of what it wants to do very well, which is that um, it asks you to take a very complex topic and create these two axes, which they call axes of uncertainty. And um, so in this case, um, this is Eric's axis over here, which is uh, policy, governance, and decision making, which starts from centralized and autonomous at the top to localized and interdependent at the bottom. On the second axis, you have design and institutional structure, which starts with closed institutions and total communities, i.e. a prison where you live and work and sleep every day. Um, and on the other side, you have flexible institutions and open communities. And what we did was we asked um, a series of architects, planners, criminal justice act activists, um, uh, we were focusing on Brownsville in Brooklyn, so we had the group Common Ground Community, who are not for profit who work in the area. We had community activists, you know, there were all kinds of people in the room, about 40 people in the room, and then each table had a representative from these interdisciplinary fields. And what we did was we gave them um, a kind of a standard land use map of the area with it and every single service and you know school and things like that on the map. And we also gave them a set of cards, um, which were data cards. This, this is some of the, so uh, on the cards were, you know, this was people of color. It happens to be about 90% black over there. Um, population move, single parent homes, homeless shelter, you know, just sort of every kind of data set that we thought would be relevant. We had about 40 of these cards. Um, and then we asked people to come up with, with, we divided the tables into these four quadrants and they had to um, invent stories. But to do this, um, the reason why Global Business Network was interested in working with us is this is usually done just with words, conversations, words, and what ends up at the end of the day is just a series of stories on the four quadrants. But what we did is we wanted to provide new maps and we used maps as a way of directing the conversation for the whole day. So what we first wanted to do was really um, make people imagine what, this, what these futures um, could be, and so we had to provide a set of examples about, you know, what the future of the city could be if the prison system changed or if the criminal justice system changed. So, beginning with John F. Kennedy High School, which uh, 4,500 kids go to school every day. It was built in 1972. Um, 
all the kids enter through a security gate. Um, it's now been divided up into campuses of small schools, and so on the one hand, you have a highly centralized uh, school system which c can be broken down into a more flexible uh, orientation. So um, this, another example we gave people was a mega church, you know, which could be called a total community where um, you know, people are entertained, they, um, they shop, they eat, all of, these, all of these kinds of things. And on the other side, you have storefront church, uh, storefront churches, and Brooklyn has the highest number of storefront churches in the whole of the United States, apparently. <laughs> um, you have the Supreme Court of Justice, which is a centralized, universal system, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and then, you, on the other hand, you have, um, you have what some people call boutique courts or community-oriented courts, which is a completely different uh, way of, um, of dealing with specific kinds of crimes in specific kinds of communities. Can you call a refugee camp a total community? Um, can you call, uh, is a gated community a total community? The only difference between a gated community and a prison is, you know, some people, they have gated communities keep people out and prisons keep people in. This happens to be a retirement community built around a series of golf courses. Not very sustainable, but some people are very interested in that. This is Rem Kulhas's Involuntary Prisoners of Architecture. You know, both two walls invited people again to come in. Um, Buckminster Fuller's Dome over Manhattan, air conditioned, designed to keep people safe and clean and breathing good air as long as nobody from Harlem enters. Um, and on the other hand, you know, the drop, the drop city dome where the domes could be inserted into any community at any time. So, you know, these were the concepts by which we really tried to stretch people's imagination, especially the ones who had no architecture training at all. And so here's what people came up with, um, you know, in <laughs> the, the quadrant one, which we thought was going to be the worst one, totalized, total institutions and centralized government. Um, Quadrant number two, which was centralized government and open communities, they invented this thing called the dynamic franchise web, where you could have hybrid service clusters and lines of affiliation. Actually, very creative, and, and some of these ideas we've, we've actually started using in New Orleans, where you can have you know a liquor store and a domestic violence center right next to each other. Um, or a child care and a work release program. There's no, there's no reason why you can't have those two kinds of institutions next door to each other and the, the, the one reinforces the negative effects of, of the other. Um, the third one, which in some ways was my favorite, um, is called the Good Mall. <laughs> and again, something you know, quite doable in a place like Brooklyn where there are tons of big boxes being, right? So why not have a mall um, which could include things like, you know, employment services or have some faith-based institutions inside of them or, you know, whatever. And it, it's just, it's a, it's a great concept. And then the fourth one, which we thought was, was going to be the utopian one, turned out to be the one with the least favorite uh, quadrant, but they did label it the checkerboard but they decided that um, it's really impossible to have everything so, close, so um, uh, dispersed and that you actually needed some kind of government intervention to, to form an infrastructure between all these support, uh, dispersed institutions. So at the end of the day, um, everybody was sort of quite excited about the results and really thought that this kind of collaboration would happen, should happen more. And the, um, the, one of the effects was that they weren't satisfied with the amount, the amount of data that was in the room. And everybody wanted you know, more up-to-date, more data, every agency to bring more data to the table so that the overlap made a more important intervention. And so um, Eric and I actually have been working with Common Ground and on uh, three or four housing projects in Brooklyn where they're doing something which they're calling a housing conservancy. And they're bringing together a lot of agencies, a lot of public-private 
funding to, um, to really do a direct analysis and some kind of reorganization of the housing project. So it's actually quite an exciting project which we hope is going to move forward. So the last thing that, um, that's the result of the combined research is um, a booklet that's, that we're going to be publishing, some of which we've um, shown in the gallery, actually we're still in the process of finishing it, um, and we're calling it a pattern book. And what we're trying to do is look at four different cities and to try and understand what some of these patterns of incarceration are. So we're doing this very simply um, by um, guessing, you know, that the percentage, so here's Phoenix, so what we're going to be showing are four maps of each city, um, percentage of people below the poverty line, percentage of people of color, percentage adults admitted to prison, and then here are prison expenditure maps which are actually zooming in on a bit in the publication. And then what we've done is we've done these density diagrams where we've overlapped those, those three different uh, variables and in order to, to pick a block to look at, right, since we aren't actually doing a lot of community work in these particular neighborhoods, we wanted to just see whether there was um, a pattern uh, where, where social, with the social conditions have anything to do with the physical, with the physical conditions. And it really was just an experiment, sort of a blind, not so blind, but a, a choosing of a, of a block to look at. So here's one in, uh, in Phoenix. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to read you about these these landscapes that you're looking at. So this is in Phoenix. The block is part of Center City Planning District, which showed a high concentration of incarcerated people in 2004. The census block is in Census Tract 1148. Of the 3,216 people living there in 2000, 77 identified themselves as Hispanic or Latino, and 53% were living in poverty. The block is located adjacent to the Maricopa Freeway, Interstate 17. The area referred to as Central City South is, lo is situated to the southwest of Phoenix downtown core and is characterized by industry, public housing, vacant land, and a 30-foot high elevated highway built in 1960. With railroad tracks and several blocks north and the Sky Harbor International Airport to the east. The area can be defined as poor and, in, and an area in transition since it falls within such a large planning initiative. A Hope 6 development is underway, which like most projects of its type, will replace the Matthew Henson public housing community torn down in 2004 with a mixed income development. The hope is to revitalize the neighborhood physically and socially. The block itself is made up of single family detached houses known as new homes. And even though these homes are now some of the oldest housing stock in Phoenix, the houses are 30 to 50 years old and hold a racially mixed African American, Latin, and Native American population. Senior citizens are a significant presence and also a large indigent population. The housing stock has deteriorated significantly and a neglected indigent cemetery and vacant residences on the east of the block represent the general pattern of disinvestment here. Despite these poor conditions, the new homes are still considered the best non-subsidized housing in the area. So here we move to Wichita. Um, this is the percentage of people living below the poverty level, percentage of people of color, percentage adults admitted to prison, and these are the uh, prison expenditures by census block. So same thing. Um, we. Uh, overlap the three variables, and this is what we found. So the block is part of Council District 1, which showed a high percentage of incarcerated people in 2003. It is part of Census Tract 7, which counted 3,365 residents in 2000, 90% of whom identified as black or African American, and 28% of whom were living in poverty. The block is located east of the Interstate 135 interchange and 21st Street exit ramp and in a neighborhood referred to as the Power neighborhood. It is characterized by detached single family residences and it lies to the south of the Hot Spring campus and lies within the 29th and Grove contaminated groundwater plume. The area shows scattered residential vacancies to the north, south, and west and considerable vacant and commercial and residential land, both indicative of general disinvestment in this area. 
The I-135 freeway, known as the Canal Route, carries 95,500 vehicles a day in and out of Wichita's core and links with three other major highways. Directly to the east of I-135 is industrial land made up of rail lines, a drainage canal, several large facilities, including the El Paso Derby refinery scheduled to be demolished. Okay, moving to New York, which Eric did a lot of, so I won't focus too much. Um, but again, we located um, this block, which is in the Bronx. Um, the block is part of Community District 1 in the South Bronx. It is part of Census Tract 230, which counted 5,900 residents in 2000, 79% of whom identified themselves as Hispanic or Latino, and 47% of whom were living in poverty. The neighborhood is known as Mott Haven and is characterized by large-scale transportation infrastructures which connect the South Bronx to the rest of the city via the Triborough Bridge. While the area to the south of the highways is largely industrial, the area to their north is marked by six-story residential buildings interspersed with four public housing projects, varying in height from eight to 16 stories and some industrial facilities. The highways, together with truck routes, waste transfer stations, and a sewage treatment plant have been implicated in studies on air pollutant exposures that may be linked to very high asthma hospitalization rates for children in the borough. The block is located one block to the north of the Major Deegan Expressway, a section of Interstate 87 that divides the mixed-use blocks of Mott Haven from the more industrial neighborhood of Port Morris to the south. It includes four of the nine 16-story buildings in the Millbrook Houses, the New York City Housing Authority development completed in 1959. The 12.3-acre complex with 3,000 residents and 1,251 apartments is a typical public housing superblock. Okay, so New Orleans, um, which is actually where I'm going to end the presentation and actually where we, we're doing a lot of work. But first, we did the same thing, um, percentage below the poverty level, percentage people of color, percent adults admitted to prison, and this is prison expenditure by block the three variables, and this is the, uh, the block we identified. So the block is at the intersection um, of planning districts two and four, and also at the intersection of Central City and the B.W. Cooper neighborhoods, both of which showed a high concentration of incarcerated people in 2003. It lies within Census Tract 69, the boundary of the whole of the B.W. Cooper neighborhood, which counted 4,361 people living there in 2000. 98.4% identified themselves as black or African American, 69.2 were living below the poverty line, and 57.7 had no high school education. The area is dominated by Interstate 10 and the contiguous Superdome, a 72,000 seat sports, sports facility, both built in 1975. These structures separate the area from the adjoining neighborhoods of Treme and Lafitte to the east. These, along with Central City to its west, had until then been centers of African American heritage and business in the city. Now, rather than a center, B.W. Cooper is linked as a neighborhood with Center City through the Hoffman Triangle, one of the low-lying and neglected areas of Planning District 2 prior to Katrina. The block itself is known as Calliope, thanks to the 600-unit uh, public housing project of that same name built in 1942. In 1954, 860 new units were added to the complex, and in 1993, a Hope 6 plan was proposed to downsize the project, demolish 337 units, and transform it into a mixed-use housing. It was not realized, although people have still not been allowed to return to to this housing block. So as soon as um, Katrina uh, happened, you know, we were at the time collaborating with, uh, with the Justice Mapping Center and had, the data, had this data set on, uh, on the prison populations. But this over here is a LIDAR map, and if you don't know what a LIDAR map is, it show, it's an elevation map of the city of New Orleans. So white in this image is the highest point in the city, and black is the lowest point in the city. So as you know, everyone knows in New Orleans, you look up to the river, and then, of course, that blue is the, is the flood, heavy flood zone in the city. 
And so what we did was we took a section cut through the LiDAR image. So as you can see, the river is high, um, and it dips down into this bowl. And then what we did was we, uh, we drew the graph of the prison populations, and it showed, of course, an inverse relation to the, to the topography, so low prison admissions. And we did this, uh, the same thing with prison, with prison expenditures. Um, so the central city where we're actually focusing um, a lot of our work right now had 4.9% of New Orleans population, 11.7% of its prison admissions. This is what it looks like. This is the block that I was talking about. Um, okay, so it's not a million dollar block on the scale of New York, but we call it a, a million dollar neighborhood. The salient fact is the millions are being spent on central city, but not in central city. So same pattern um, in 2006. So although only 57% of the population had returned um, and the prison populations were not precisely you know, inside the so-called housing projects, that it's shifted, but the concentration in New Orleans is still exactly, exactly the same. Um, and so what we're doing now, and we're doing it this actually through the city city council who have actually really taken on this project with a vengeance, um, we've asked, you know, what if the rebuilding process worked to strengthen communities, change patterns of incarceration, and break the cycle of reentry and return to prison? And I don't know if you've been following New Orleans at all, but everything is being thought of from the ground up, whether it's succeeding or failing, it's been rethought. And everything has been rethought except for criminal justice. So we've kind of made this intervention just at the right moment where the Office of Recovery and, and Management has taken, has taken on this project and are asking for recommendations from us on what to do in terms of reinvestment at the neighborhood level. And so we've defined there's only two or three neighborhoods, in fact, in New Orleans, considering the fact that some of them have been completely wiped out, but that's a whole different, that's a whole different issue. But we're focusing on the three neighborhoods that are back and in operation and figuring out some strategies of, of what to do over there. So Central City, you've probably read about it in the news, it is a, the hotspot both of crime and of um, prison populations. And we've made an extremely detailed map of any, anything, uh, geographic map of anything that would relate to um, something that would have to do with um, criminal justice reform. So the juvenile justice program of Louisiana, the YMCA, the United Way. I mean, these are all organizations that are actually doing things in relation to criminal justice but don't have a relationship to one another. And the second thing we did is did a non-geographic map, which is a network diagram, to show what the relationships uh, were between these organizations and how they might be reinforced with actually very simple means and very little amount of funding. Um, and we, we've started to suggest some ideas like linking through a, you know, a, green, whoops, a green network. Um, you know, this is the neutral ground. And you know, trying to link some very successful uh, programs that are already in existence and reinforce them through making physical, physical <coughs> connections between them. So on the one hand, you know, we're doing the social networking project where we're actually linking all these people together on Facebook just so that they can first actually get to know each other. <laughs> and then through that, trying to establish new relationships to increase some connections between, between people. And then on the other hand, um, the Vera Institute for Justice have come in with a whole um, criminal justice reform project and are doing a community court and um, a bunch of other programs and we're trying to put all those things together in the same neighborhood so that it becomes a model a model neighborhood for what justice reinvestment might mean. Just a pity that it had to happen in New Orleans, but <laughs> that's where right now things are being rethought in very in very innovative ways. So okay. We're open to questions from both the policy and and the
that is all. Questions from audience members for Erica Dora and Laura Kurgan. I think Lindsay has a microphone. Okay. Ann Munley. by the city council where we had lots of, um, not, not quite in the same uh, controlled way as the scenario planning workshop, but tons of meetings bringing together various agencies. And I know Eric has done that in Phoenix as well. Right, we've been doing something like it, but we have actually thought about proposing doing a, a series of these, three or four in different cities and uh, extending them. We did it in a very quick turnaround in Brooklyn but they usually can take three, four weeks, months to get the right people together. Um, and, you know, we, because of the turnout and because it was such a new way of doing things for everybody involved, I think it's probably worth, worth thinking about. Yeah. I'm just curious if it takes like a hurricane to really make people change the way that they think about things. Have you had more success in Phoenix? Or has it been just drastically different in New Orleans, just in terms of people's responses to changing things? Because now that a lot of things are like clean, they're kind of more open to changing things drastically. Well, yeah, I think it's both. I, I think people do take advantage of those sort of sort of governing through crisis um, kinds of approaches. But um, in some ways, because of the prison crisis in a lot of states, uh, things are happening. The Wichita work that Laura pointed to has been taken on by a few other groups now, and um, there's a whole uh, there's a large scale housing investment project being undertaken in the first uh, city council district connected to um, interrupting the flow of people into prison. There's a you know they're rethinking probation and reintegrating them into the neighborhood in a way that makes them part of it rather than sort of overseers of it. So and Phoenix is now a, actually a very large project. That's a collaboration between state, city, government, county government, and across sectors are starting to talk together at the table about how to focus in on a particular neighborhood that's been chosen already to work with. Um, and so these things take, what I'm finding is it's taking two, three, four years for the ideas to percolate up and to you know galvanize enough action to start doing something. But in each of these cities, along with Houston and along with Las Vegas, believe it or not, um, things have started to, to take place. Um, it's not the same in every place, though. It's really, yeah. it's really contoured to the conditions and the politics and the available players in each place. It's, it's in, in fact, there is a lot going on in New York with, um, yeah. in relation to this, right. to this because of Bloomberg's poverty initiative and not really directly related to the but there's a whole um, initiative to do with ho the, the overlap between homeless populations and jail populations, and they've identified about 11 neighborhoods where they're actually doing doing some work. But the New Orleans is a whole different world, <laughs> you know. I mean, because it's a it's a city. The problems of New Orleans were just exacerbated by Katrina, right? We all know that. And number two. Um, crime dropped. There was, there was no crime in, in, in New Orleans for five months. How many? Five months. And then suddenly, an incredible surge of violence um, it erupted, you, 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 might, you might say. And people who were trying to come back, reinvest in New Orleans, get New Orleans back, really started freaking out. And so, in fact, what, was, what we were trying to try and understand was whether this was true or not. And it, in fact, you know, I, I'm not a good enough analyst, a, analyst to, to understand whether this was true or not, but the rates are not nearly as high of pre-Katrina and post-Katrina. It's just that crime has moved around the city and it's now on the high grounds and it's much more exposed. It's not so isolated. 
And so it's a very, very complex um, uh, dynamic of, uh, I, I could probably write a whole book about it, but. Oh, and there, know, is, there yeah, are some I mean, interesting things written about crime and the whole, yeah. this is the whole way that crime was used um, during Katrina as a way of sort of characterizing the city, you know, the, the, all the stories about the lootings and the violence in the stadiums, et cetera, and all that turned out to be false, in fact. These, these things weren't happening, and in, in fact, a whole range of other sort of hero stories about people helping out were happening, and it was a very strange use of crime. But when you go from zero crime, because everyone was dispersed, to a moderate level of crime, it seems like a crime wave in a certain I don't know who, yeah. Um, this is kind of a interest or esoteric question, but um, do, do you look at, do you ever look at um, other countries or other um, models of uh, um, countries that have successful uh, um, criminal justice systems or social infrastructure, um, and do you ever implement that into your, um, your analysis of um, local or state? analysis in the country. Like where? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yes, I mean, obviously, and it's, and it's, what's interesting is in fact how linked they are. Um, is that me? Mm -hmm. uh, how linked, you know, the way in which social welfare structures and criminal justice structures are in fact highly related. These are not separate, they're, they're linked to one another. Um, but in fact, this is a very different system. The social welfare system here is radically different than the social welfare system in Northern Europe, and so is the, so are the criminal justice numbers. So, um, it, you know, that's a in some ways it's a um, it's a content question about what what is it like to govern that way and how does it relate to criminal justice. In other ways, it's a political question. Is that the way in which um, we can foster a rethinking around this and? Um, we haven't found that to be true. It's not that we're not aware, and in fact we are, of course, aware of um, a whole range of different ways of, of uh, using punishment and dealing with conditions, but it's sort of getting uh, the right people in the right places to that point that's been the real, real challenge. Um, obviously the mapping is uh, incredibly important and incredibly impressive, but it's missing a piece of the story, isn't it, which is the larger political economy of prisons. And so prisons are sold up here as a great economic boom, right, mm. which they are. So they're sold that way. Mm. And so are there ways, have you started exploring ways to link up the transformations of, of uh, prison hosting communities, as well as what's going on in the neighborhoods in, in New York or in Phoenix or wherever? I said, you know, that's a great question. And in fact, of course, this is in some ways a very carefully sort of politically scripted kind of way of doing things. Um, but lots of connections have been made in, in a whole range of venues between, you know, uh, toxic waste, um, casinos, and prisons as the sort of last ditch economic development strategy for places that have um, yeah. been right. dis but disinvested I, in. Right. But I, there, there are a, there's an interesting new sort of project in Brownsville that's just now emerging to think about uh, to take advantage of this kind of upstate, downstate um, uh, uh, farmers market work in which they're now starting to target a bunch of folks who are coming back to Brownsville from state prisons and they're looking to take over state, here's the, here's the ir irony of it all, state mental institutions that were of course defunded uh, back in the 80s, right, and, and um, utterly unused and transform them into botanical growth and farmers' areas that, that we would that prisoners would end up working in and become transitional in employment, bring the farmers' markets down to Brownsville. Et so there's some experiments with linking that, but it's very tough um, to link the two. But uh, they are linked right. in See, that flesh I trade have way. That's a stronger answer sure. um, to that, which is no, which is that this is you, you know the focus of the maps is transforming the project into one about the city. Right, because we're more interested in the people who, and I think you know the problem of these small towns is a problem of globalization, not of you know not of the criminal justice system, and so to solve the problem of the, you have to go another place. Whereas the problem of the city is the problem of the city and the problem of these people being shipped, you know, the overuse of incarceration on 
in poor communities. You know? So, yeah. <laughs> I don't think the problem was invented to solve the problem of small towns upstate or any place else. questions in the back and one here and one here, and then maybe we'll call it up. Yeah. This is, yeah. Hi, I'm oh. way back here. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank you for the, the lecture. I think it's wonderful how you transform something so esoteric as all of this information and then beautifully made it in these diagrams which show real solutions that can be um, actually used in real life situations. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if the data ever points you in the direction of completely scrapping the original footprint of the city as it is in reality and kind of offering you a new solution in terms of either fragmenting the footprint or doing it completely different somewhere else. <laughs> It's well. a very good question, but I, um, you, you, we're trying to um, grapple with what's there, and I'm still, I, I'm still grappling with with what's there and how to and how to interpret what's there, right? Because you could say um, the, the, the maps could point to the Hope Six projects, which uh, demolish the housing projects, right? Because a lot of housing projects show up. In these, in these maps. Not only housing projects, and in fact, when you actually quantify it, it's lots of little walk-ups, and you know, there's lots more of that landscape than the housing projects. But when you think about a project like Robert Moses, which um, used data you know, to justify slum clearance because of crime, um, and then you see however many years later that th those same projects are being demolished because of the same supposed reason which is crime in the in the housing projects I think you really have to think more about what what is implied in those kinds of decisions to demolish large parts of cities and how that those kinds of policies get written I'm, I don't have conclusions on that yet. so you know so to invent another utopia for me I just I I, I hope you will <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great project. <laughs> but, yeah. um, I would like to return to the question of the political, the role of political economy, um, and suggest, based on um, my experience doing criminal justice reform work, that there really does need to be a linkage between the transformation of the city and the transformation in rural places. Um, I Just last week I was in Albany sort of lobbying, if you will, on expansion of community-based options to incarceration. And the folks we were meeting with acknowledged that crime was down and the programs that we were talking about were effective. But they said we can only really we can't realize those savings because we can't close the prisons because of the politics in upstate. So I'm suggesting that and want your reaction about the notion of taking some of the information that we now have about what those small town economies used to look like and sort of breaking down the myth of the benefit of the prison economy and perhaps creating some discussion in those communities that would lead them to go in a different direction vis-a-vis -vis their economic development needs and therefore be able to form more of an alliance to actually do this justice reinvestment and transform cities. I'd like your comments on that. Um, well, again, they're, they're, you're right, and there is a lot of, there are, uh, those connections are being made by a number of different advocates you know, the debunking of um, prisons as an economic generator in um, rural and small town communities is out there. And, and there's more and more of that work done in California, maybe even than in New York. Um, but you're right, it's out there and it can be. And, and New York is actually a different and special case, partly because uh, it's it, among all the states, New York's prison population has actually been dropping for about nine straight years. Uh, prisons have actually been decommissioned in the state, but the problem in some ways is that, you know, whether it's a prison or a hospital, counties tend to consider those dollars theirs. And just because we no longer need the prison 
to incarcerate those 2,500 people doesn't mean that the county wants to give up the dollars that were associated with that prison. And so there's, a, there's both a problem and an opportunity in that, in rethinking how those dollars could be reinvested locally in the original county, but perhaps you know some kind of split with the urban communities for which they were sort of involved in a flesh trade. Well, yeah. ask the last question. <laughs> and maybe that's appropriate. As an architect and an instructor of the architecture program here, I'd like to maybe end with um, a question to both of you about the future direction of, of all of this. In terms of the impact or the, where, where this investigation is leading um, to the role that this one environment plays in all of this, mm -hmm. I had the opportunity of doing a housing project in Flying Bush, Brooklyn. 30 years ago. Hmm. One of the things that we were very much concerned about was the capacity of building mm -hmm. physical environment and maybe even architecture to redirect or remediate problems that were rooted in all these yeah. social and economic issues. That, that is, idealized as that may be, was it not possible that through some selective and intelligent sort of modification to the physical environment, it could have positive social yeah. And so the Marcus Berry Housing Project came out of it. It pointed to partial was Oscar Newman's work on defensive space. And to this day, as far as I know, it's still a fairly successful project in that within this island, rather within this area that shows up on your map as being a highly concentrated area from which um, individuals who yeah. uh -huh. end up being car incarcerated on or come from, mm -hmm. that there is this little island. <laughs> Mm -hmm. where, as far as I know to this day, still uh, uh, seems to be kind of a model of what can be done. So my question to you mm -hmm. would be, first of all, is it your intention to carry the analysis to an even finer grain mm -hmm. of, of development mm -hmm. so that one can look at, for instance, conditions of the physical environment, urban typology, spatial typologies, and maybe even you know, individual circumstances of the block itself that tend towards remediation of that. In other words, that there could be a parallel analysis that one would do, not of the areas that seem to be ground zero for all the problems, but comparable areas that seem to be successful, but they are models of success, where you're using the same kind of population, mm -hmm. cross-section, but that they seem to be working. I know that, for instance, in Harlem now, in the past 10 years or so, mm -hmm. blocks that were um, the uh, that, that were areas of very high crime rate have mm -hmm. now completely reverted. The right. populations haven't changed, yeah. but the, the, the block, the, 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 the character of the social circumstance of those blocks has improved. Mm -hmm. And it, in some cases, it seems to be attributable to, for instance, the presence of stoops or porches where people can observe and be observed and so forth. That there is something in the physical environment so that can actually contribute to remediation of this country. This is something that you were looking at or planning. Yeah. Well, see, I, I, it's a such a tricky uh, it's a, such a tricky set of issues, right? Because I um, the way I would do it is I would compare, you know, the Marseille block in Paris that's full of crime to the Marseille block that's beautiful and everybody loves to live there and it's very expensive, right? So I happen to not think that architecture per se can do anything by itself in this in this set of circumstances. So I wouldn't say it's about the stoops necessarily. Although, you know, I think I think the conversation needs to take place between architects like yourself who, and and some of the architects like yourself used to believe that um, that architecture um, could pave a bold new way way to a bold bold new future and could solve the problems of the world. A lot of those same architects now don't understand why an architect would be interested in this conversation at all because this should not be something that an architect should be interested in at all, right? So, so there is there's some conversation that needs to take place across those across those generations to try and solve the problem, right? Which is why why has why has the discussion in architecture shifted so radically right now so as not to be even be able to address this architecturally without 
um, new urbanism and defensible space as the only solutions, right? Because I don't think that those that those two that the combination of new urbanism and defensible space has gotten us very far. And does that does that I, I don't know that we might have to have an, a long well, argument sure. about that? <laughs> but it's a big it's a big. I, I, well, let me add. I'm, I'm afraid it's an argument we'll have to have over Outside, long. okay. <laughs> <laughs> because the caterers yeah. want to stay all night. So, yeah. I, will you join me in thanking our yeah. speakers?